Um, so I got the inspiration to write my book when I was healing from bulimia at the age of 16. And it was one of the most difficult periods of my life. But it really turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me because I not only learned how to heal using Jungian psychology, but I also learned about my own intuitive and psychic abilities, how to accept them, how to express them, how to not fear them. A lot of people I work with talk to me about having all these abilities and they're, they're afraid of them and they're not sure what to do with it. Um, so going through that crisis kind of forced me in a good way to learn more about my own abilities and my guides told me I'd be writing some books to help teach people what I had learned. So my process as a medical and spiritual intuitive is pretty different. Um, using just a name and age, I create a four page extensive report and it's very individualized. It talks about all things physical, emotional, and spiritual. So we look at the issues that people are having that may be causing them difficulty. Um, people's strengths, your life purpose, relationships, career, trauma, parenting, you know, everything that has to do with your well being, and look at some of the root causes for the issues that people are having, and then do a lot of problem solving in terms of, you know, how to move forward, what can be done. Um, I have physicians and other practitioners that I refer to in terms of getting people physical assistance and doing additional testing to kind of verify what I've said. Um, and then the second part of the report, I mean, I'm sorry, the second part of the reading. So I send the report and painting before I meet with anyone. The second part is the paintings that Hugh were talking about, was talking about. And I tune into my guides and ask for a symbolic representation of what is going on in someone's body and soul. Every single painting is different. Here's one example. Um, where the colors are, the position of the arms and, and legs and the body parts, um, it, the intensity of the color, kind of every single thing has a meaning for I'll show you some more examples in a second too, but for example, when I get these blue arrows coming in, um, one of the meanings of the color blue is about being empathic and sensitive. And so when I have these arrows, this is often the influence of other people's energy coming in on the person's energy field and mind. And, and as an empath, um, a lot of my clients are empaths, a lot of you probably are empaths too, it's very easy to pick up that energy and sometimes it's hard to set up boundaries. So we talk about that. Let me show you another example. You will use this one. Um, so a little bit of glare, but um, in this case, this person's hands are protecting their heart and they're blue. So it's about protecting your feelings, protecting your heart. The, the heart and throat chakras and some other areas are magenta. Um, magenta is about being your true self, not caring about what people think, you doing you, being creative. So this person felt an intense need to protect and nurture um, their creative and unique heart. So... That's a quick little synopsis. Um, I started out as a licensed counselor, always working very intuitively, and then learned more about my abilities as I worked with clients. And I didn't always let people know that I had these intuitive and psychic abilities. So, but it kind of caught up to me because as I was working with clients, I would accidentally start channeling their relatives who had passed on and sending them messages. And it was, it was kind of scary at first and very weird, but it also felt like the most natural thing in the world to be doing. So I not only was able to help people with their emotional and physical issues, 
I was able to help them connect to their intuition, to feel safe, and to know that they were being watched and guided from the other side. Um, I guess one of the things that I would like to share with you, so something, a tool that you can take with you, I believe that connecting with intuition, self-love and self-acceptance is the one of the most important tools for healing. And so I am asked quite frequently, how can I connect to my intuition? What's a great way of doing that? And more details about this are in my book, but I think about intuition as a loving force that is part of everyone. It's not woo-woo at all. It could be like your higher power or a part of you that knows what's best for you. So it doesn't have to be, you know, people will say to me, I'm not intuitive. You don't have to have any special abilities to do this. The technique is to physically write out a question or statement or your feelings and direct it to your intuition. When I say intuition, when I started out, I didn't know how to do this at all. So I talked to God, God as being where I came from. There are people who talk to loved ones in spirit, use them as their guides. So you write out whatever you need to write out. Um, sometimes I just start writing out my feelings and ask for some guidance. Sometimes I will just say, do you have anything to tell me today? Um, sometimes I'll ask a question, you know, about doing something career-wise or health or supplement or there's no, there's no limit. There's no real, you know, right or wrong, but you write that to your intuition and you just wait and see what you hear and feel back, um, you know, responding to what you wrote and write that down. And then you write back to it. And then you see what you get, you write that down, write back to it. And you're just having a written conversation, you know, with your intuition and writing down both sides. And it's, it's a pretty special way of feeling like you're not alone, like you have a friend, you know, like you have protection and love. And this is something that I learned when I was 16, recovering from the eating disorder, and it saved my life. I still do it to this day. Another way that I recommend using that technique is to talk to your body and talk to your symptoms like they're your friends. We're so used to fighting. We're so used to thinking that something's wrong with us or that it's this anxiety, you know, an anxiety provoking thing to, to be sick or be injured or have something wrong. And of course it is anxiety provoking. But this idea that we have to fight things all the time, um, I think can put us on the defensive. So try talking to them like they're your friends, like, why, why are you here? Um, what would you like me to know? How can I help you heal? How are you trying to get my attention? You know, maybe you're not being true to yourself. Maybe you need to to speak up. Maybe you're in a job that is not serving you or you're in a relationship that's making you miserable. It could be anything. Maybe you're just not doing enough self-care. So I believe that our symptoms and circumstances are a really important way that our intuition and spirit talk to us and give us signals. And if we're fighting it, it's very hard to, to listen if we're not connected to our bodies, everything gets shut off. So we're cut off from our intuition. So if we can be open and be open to what they have to say to us, instead of thinking it's something negative or bad, um, we really can grow and heal and learn from that. I send the painting to the person. Um, I don't interpret it before because I want the process to flow and I don't want to have any preconceived notions of, notions of what I think it is. So during the meeting, we will look at the painting. And so for this one example, 
Um, I'll start by describing what I'm hearing from my guides in spirit. Um, so like in this case, for example, the first thing I, I painted was this blue area on top. And that was an indication to me that the person is highly empathic and highly sensitive and is really seeing the world through other people's eyes. And yellow is about being a spiritual teacher and generous and intuitive. Um, and then the magenta, as I talked about before, is about being your true authentic self and not caring so much about what people think. So just this part of it, um, the person did confirm that that resonated with them because that's really important. And we were able to talk about how other people's energy and emotions are impacting that person. Um, what they could do to recognize their emotions and separate them from other people's emotions. So to ask yourself, you know, is what I'm feeling mine or is I'm picking it up from others? Um, we talked about how doing that, even though that can be difficult, because when we express our true feelings and when we set boundaries, sometimes we feel like we're going to be rejected or abandoned and people treat us differently. But we talked about the fact that when you are true to yourself, you become a spiritual teacher for everyone around you. And even though that lesson might be difficult, it's very important. Um, and then we also talked about how if you stop seeing the world through other people's eyes and trying to please them and kind of, um, you know, get to know your authentic true self, which, which is the magenta, um, that is really so much of the process of, of why we're here and what they're supposed to be doing. So we go through the painting and talk about what things mean and then what people can do to work on the issues and strengths that are shown in the painting. Um, so orange, this is the fifth chakra. The fifth chakra is about expression. And orange is often about courage and, um, and independence. So spirit is saying you have the courage to express yourself um, and do what you need to do and say what you need to say. And you may not feel like you have the courage, but this is showing that you do. And then the three red dots under there, red is often about anxiety, fear, anger. So anxiety, fear, and anger, um, may be trying to block some of that self-expression and having this message there brings it up so we can talk about it. You know, what are some of your fears about expressing yourself? Um, are you feeling anger and, and you don't know how to, um, healthily express that or are you afraid of it? So it's really a, a starting point for a conversation and it helps to confirm some of the things I wrote in the report that we talked about and also give me additional information. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it really, um, I like them because they are very positive. They are, everything I do is very positive. Sometimes people are afraid to have a reading because they're you know, afraid of what they might hear. But I really, I'm honest, but I make things very positive and talk about what you can do, you know, how you can empower yourself. So it's definitely a way to learn more about what you need to focus on, um, what you may want to do, for example. Um, if a lot of creativity things show up in the painting, we can talk about are you creative? Are, are you afraid to be creative? How could you be creative? You know, how can you express yourself in that way? So, so absolutely. Um, and your other question is, can the same method be applied to a project travel location? Um, well, I guess it can. Um, sometimes I will use these, often I will use these paintings to ask my guides and spirit what I need to know. 
So, or if there's something that's bothering me, if there's something, right, if there's something um, that I need guidance on, I will do a painting for myself and ask spirit to tell me what I need to know or give me a direction. So, um, just, I get, you know, they could be used kind of like a personal oracle card um, in that you can ask maybe what do I need to do to figure out, you know, what my, um, what my authentic stuff looks like, or, um, can you give me a direction in terms of life purpose or, you know, moving or any of the things that you, you talked about? So, um, I hadn't really thought about that. That's an amazing question. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You can tune into your intuition and have it give you information through this art. And the best part is you don't need any artistic ability. You don't need to be intuitive. You don't, you know, this is not a, um, something that's only accessible to people with gifts. Um, I do workshops on these. Um, I haven't, I don't have anything coming up, but I've done them before. And, and I sort of teach people how to do these and they're always really amazed at what comes out of them. Um, it's sort of like a dream that we interpret. And my book teaches people how to do that as well. Great question. Um, the colors on the painting do not usually correspond to traditional chakra colors. It's more individualized for the person. But what often comes up is this is another way that I get information about physical conditions and the relationship between that person's emotional state or trauma that they have dealt with. So for example, I'll go back to this one, um, there is red around the first and second chakra areas. Um, there's red in the first chakra and this person happened to be dealing with pelvic pain and lower back pain. Um, they also had some issues with their hips. So this was kind of a confirmation of what I had gotten from my guides in the report um, and addi additional information about where some of that pain was. Um, also, she had pain in her knees. So that was indicated there. And then we were able to talk about some of the trauma that she has had related to the second chakra. And this could be sexual abuse or assault. It could be growing up with people who did not honor or respect women. Um, anything that kind of, you know, second chakra is all about, it's sexual organs and lower back and things like that, hips, hip flexors. But it's also about um, career, um, relationships, you know, female and male energy, so the balance between male and female energy. So it's a wonderful way to illustrate how physical symptoms in a part of the body um, correspond to all of the emotional and spiritual characteristics of that chakra. And in my book, there's a very detailed ch chapter on each chakra explaining all of the intricate details and different characteristics and it helps people to there's a my own kind of chart in there that you do yourself I'm teaching people to be their own medical intuitives and you figure out your symptoms and then decide where they fit within that that chakra system and then it helps you identify what maybe different issues or different experiences you're having that are maybe creating some of those, you know, physical and emotional issues. So um, during my readings, I do start with an Oracle card and sorry that you get to see my armpit. Um, one of my favorites is, is this one It's called um, Keepers of the Light, which you guys probably sell there. And I use the Oracle card myself to start me on the process of connecting with spirit, to get me out of my own head um, as kind of a meditative thing to 
help me tune in to the overall energy of the person and give me a direction on, on where to start. Um, I don't use pendulums and other um, techniques during my readings. I just ask spirit for information. But in my book, I talk about using different tools to help you connect with intuition. Um, I don't think they should be used too often because they can kind of get to be a little bit addictive or used as a crutch. And we don't, we think we need them to talk to our intuition and we really don't, but they can be a really fun, great tool for, you know, if you are feeling blocked or, um, and actually during my recovery from the eating disorder, working with a Jungian counselor, we used runes. And that was the first time I was introduced to something like that. And, and they were a great help. It's amazing stuff. Um, yeah, Carl Jung, for people not familiar with him, he is, he was, he's no longer with us, but he really was a genius and, and he was so far ahead of his time. And he was a famous psychiatrist who was very open to astrology and oracle cards and spirituality and intuition. And he, he was fairly traditional as much as you could be um, until he started to have these visions of bloody rivers and death and things like that. And they were really terrifying to him. He thought that he was schizophrenic or he just thought he was losing his mind. And instead of running away from those difficult emotions and the fears, instead of pushing them down, like we often do, he decided to take a different approach and to go into active waking trances. And in those trances, he learned to talk to his guides. He learned to talk to spirit. He opened himself up to this whole new world and he saw these visions and dreams and fantasies. And he kept, he kept a record. He wrote everything down, all of these conversations. And then he created this amazing, amazing spiritual artwork um, because he wasn't always able to put what he saw and felt into words. So I think, and, and also from that work, that's where he developed all of his theories and practices that literally changed the world that people like Louise Hay and, and Tara Brock and so many millions of people have taken their you know, ideas from. Um, he came up with the idea of, or with the concept of introvert and extrovert. He's behind all, you know, the Myers-Briggs things. Um, he's one of the first ones to talk about the symbolism behind symptoms and how we don't necessarily need, you know, how we don't need to fight them. If we listen to them, they can be our friend and help guide us. There were so many things that he thought about and, um, and it's really, really fascinating. But I think that my work with Young, who literally saved my life, I think that really inspired me um, unconsciously. I didn't know it at the time, but I think it really inspired me to create these paintings for people um, from the intuitive information that I received from my guides. So the Red Books online, you know, you can check it out. Um, definitely go into the store and look at a copy because it's like a two foot by three foot high book and um, it's all in this fancy script and the illustrations are amazing and um, and I really encourage people to kind of create their own red books so you know have conversations with spirit have conversations with your intuition write that down um, create artwork from them you don't have to create a masterpiece but just open up that dialogue and see where it takes you Sure, sure. Um, there are some people who know the names of them and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I do not know any of their names. I, when I sit down and I guess talk to my guides, what I see is me kind of sitting at a circular, half, half circular table. And in the front row are, I know I have a Native American elder male who's been there with me forever. 
Um, I know that there are some sort of Mayan um, women. I see my grandmother and my mom, and then I see these rows and rows of, of people, angels, spirits, if you will, and I can't see any of their faces, but I know that they're always there protecting me. And I was told when I was recovering that not to be afraid of any negative or even evil energy that I pick up because love is always more powerful than evil. We totally control our feelings, our emotions. We control what comes in and out unless we're in an altered state. Um, you know, for example, like a, a drug altered state or something like that. But we control whether that comes in or out. So they told me that evil uses fear to try to change people and to try to get them to betray themselves and that I had nothing to fear. They were sort of coming after me, making themselves known because they didn't want me to be sharing what I learned. They didn't want me to be talking about love and they didn't want me to help people connect to spirit, you know, and find themselves. So that was a really important, important lesson. Um, and I really encourage others not to be afraid of what they hear and feel and see and to just be just be open like people will say to me I don't really feel anything when I try to connect to intuition or my guides like nothing's really there and the truth is it's often that you don't feel worthy or you just feel like I'm just making this up and it just sounds like a voice in my head and and you know they expect it to be this mind-blowing experience where they see angels and, and all that and that's not what it is like nine times out of ten when I'm doing my readings or talking to my guides um, it really does just sound like my voice and I I feel intuitively that it's you know coming from other places and even sometimes from within myself because we do know what's best for us and we have a guiding voice inside of us but it does not have to be a earth-shattering event um you know just listen and see where it takes you and and risk letting go of some of that control that so many of us hold on to yeah i love what susan said about they working their guides working together um team of collective consciousness and um and they all do have kind of special little roles i believe that too so that's a great comment Yes, I first hear a color, um, so I will I will pull out a color and start, and then I often will see maybe a foggy-ish area, just for example, so I'll wet the paper. They'll tell me to wet the paper and then add the paint to that, and it becomes sort of, you know, mushy and foggy. Um, and then they have me pick another color. They, they start to show me an, the beginning of an image. It kind of um, shows itself gradually, but... Sometimes it's a figure, sometimes it's an animal, sometimes it's a plant, they're all different. Um, I often have loved ones from the other side who come in during this process as well as during my report process and they will have me often signify themselves with yellow, maybe with a butterfly, maybe with a, a symbol that is significant to the person that I'm doing the reading for. So I often get, you know, information from the other side too. Um, but it really is kind of like, it's, it's usually from the top down um, and they just gradually tell me what colors to use, where to put them. They may um, show me an emotion. So if I feel like someone is fearful, um, you know, they'll often my symbol for that is like, you know, hands like this or, if somebody has very broad shoulders, I always hear weight of the world on their shoulders. So that can be somebody who's feeling a lot of pressure and stress and being pretty overwhelmed by it. So it's, you really do have to let go of any preconceived notions or expectations or ideas and let it happen and not worry about 
what the end product is going to be. So if I'm in a workshop and people are like, I am not artistic, I can't do this, this is just going to look ridiculous. I'm, I'm, you know, I remind them that my paintings look like they're done by a five-year-old and that that's exactly what they're supposed to look like and that no one's judging you, we're not putting these on display. This is just between you and spirit um, and, you know, just kind of go with it. Yeah, I, I try to um, help people illustrate what I'm talking about through my own crazy stories. Uh, so, yes, that is a true story. Um, we used to go to, we're Italian, half Italian family, half Russian, half Italian. Uh, and so every Christmas Eve, we would go to my Italian grandmother's house and eat tons of fish. And every, there was a, it was a big family, so there were seven brothers and sisters. And every year, someone was picked to be Santa and they dress up as Santa and sit under the tree and hand the presents out to the zillions of, of grandchildren. And so there was one year, I think I was maybe 10 years old, and I have two younger brothers. And um, I remember my father, it was my father's year to do Santa, so fine. So as all kids will do, my cousins and I looked under the tree and tried to find the presents with our names on them. And I realized that there were no presents with any of me or my brother's names on them. They just, everybody else was there, but no one. So I went to my mother, not really caring about me, like I didn't really need anything, but more thinking about how my younger brothers would feel, like that's horrible. Um, and I told her that there were no presents under the tree for any of us, just for my cousins. And so she came and looked and she's like, oh my God. And um, so, you know, she told my father who was, they were both furious. And there was a Toys R Us right down the street. And um, now, the background to the story is my my grandmother is the one who bought all the presents and made arrangements and you know the parents would tell them what their kids want and she would go buy the presents so um, you know my grandmother knew all about this this was this was her show and so my parents went to Toys R Us thankfully it was open on Christmas Eve and they they kind of overbought um, they bought tons of presents for me and my brothers um, to you know kind of say this is not okay and um, my father got his little costume on and started handing out presents. And I was incredibly empathic and incredibly sensitive and always knew that my grandmother's energy was horrible. I really felt an evil energy from her. So, you know, I looked over at her when he started handing out presents to me and my brothers. And the look on her face was just like shock, anger, um, disbelief. It, it was kind of an amazing, amazing situation, and and that has really stuck with me. Um, you know, my family was pretty dysfunctional. My my dad had some pretty major issues, and it does make sense in terms of you know what kind of influence he had. So um, yeah, that's a true story. And that bullying experience, I was bullied because I, I was 10 years old and got my period very early. I, you know, I was developed, so I looked different than a lot of the other girls who were little stick figures. And just people, girls especially, can be really cruel. And um, they found a tampon in my pocketbook, which I hadn't even had my period, but my mother was like, you're probably going to get it, so put it in there. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I was targeted, but um, I was teased unmercifully for, you know, from April till the end of the school year. And it was every single day um, they got boys involved. It was shaming, shaming my body. I couldn't escape. There was no other classes to go in. And I was with these people all day long. Um, I couldn't tell my parents because I was, I just was embarrassed. I felt ashamed. The teachers did nothing. And... One of the things I ended up working, you know, with a therapist much later, and she said that I had come out basically with the same effects as somebody who had been sexually abused. So it made sense because it made me want to hide my breasts and, you know, hide body hair and just hide my whole body. And it made me feel dirty and like there was something wrong with me and my body. And that impacted every chakra. Um, 
because it impacts your your quality of life and and your spiritual relationship and it I was detached from my body because I didn't want to be in this body you know there's something wrong with it um, it affects your first chakra because that is safety and security you should be able to go to school and feel safe and secure like you weren't going to be attacked and I didn't have that I never felt safe um, you know we didn't have internet yet, yet then but they would call me on the phone and do things even out of school so um, and you know your your heart shock with your emotions I was incredibly sensitive and I took all of that so personally like there was something wrong with me but um, that was one of the contributors to developing the eating disorder because I literally hated my body and I could not express my feelings so everything got pushed down and emotional eating is a super common thing in every society so certain foods make you feel better they make you feel calmer they create good brain chemicals and so I would eat and I would eat emotionally and then I would start to gain weight and and that was terrifying too so um, it was a huge contributor to depression I never had depression before that um, and anxiety and just feeling incredibly insecure I wanted to hide I didn't want people to see me um, a lot of us are afraid of being seen I didn't want to be seen I didn't want to be heard I just wanted people to not even think I was there so just you know that one experience really impacted my whole life my whole body and, and every chakra so I help people to figure out let's say you have a feeling um, and you're you're an adult or whatever or a kid I work with kids too and you have a feeling and I ask people to identify where they feel it in their bodies uh, it may be multiple places so get in touch with that feeling allow it even though it's painful and scary allow the feeling just be with it it's a safe environment and then try to label the feeling and then ask what is that related to you know is that a, a trigger from a previous time is it something you're dealing with now um, maybe you need to be anxious because it's a warning about something like anxiety and depression aren't always bad they're signals so connect with that feeling and then also ask yourself is it mine or am I picking it up from somebody else that happens often so to just kind of be with the feeling and then and talk to the feeling and say what can I do to help you to have compassion for yourself at that age and now instead of being ashamed of feelings because we all think we have to be strong and put on this brave front um, look at it without judgment without shame just as an objective feeling and say you know what that makes sense it's okay to feel it that way and it's totally normal um, and to just try to love and accept yourself as much as possible and the more you do it the easier it gets but that's just kind of one one thing I mean I I always knew that there was something different about me I always knew that there was something not right about my life I remember being three and looking at my parents and saying you guys are not emotionally equipped to raise me I am on my own here and so I remember talking to a voice a lot or voices and um, looking back you know that were that was my guides and things but um, the bullying episode was definitely it definitely took me inward um, it helped me be more compassionate toward other people. I was never a mean person anyway, but it helped me be more compassionate to people in pain. And I didn't really, I think I didn't really process a lot of it because I just went into the food addiction to try to, you know, um, avoid all that. But I think when I was in the you know in the middle of the bulimia and throwing up three times a day I decided I just cannot live this way so I'm either gonna take my own life or I'm going to get help and that's when I called our pediatrician you know about telling my parents so I feel like that was really a um, 
a spiritual awakening and it was a gift and it was divine intervention to help me to, you know, be able to go on and do this work and, and teach other people what I had learned and, and help them through books and counseling and, and everything else, you know, but, um, but I was ready at that point because I was like, I can't live this way anymore. So I have to either do something or, or leave. Um, thank you very much. That was a huge compliment. And um, that is what I was going for. Um, I try to, people have said you're about, you're one of the most grounded woo woo people I've ever met. Um, so that's important to me to be evidence based as well. I think that the best medical practitioners, whether they're traditional or not, are highly intuitive. And I've actually talked to doctors about this and nurses, and some of them will say, well, it's just my experience. And, and there is certainly that point. But I feel like the best ones are intuitive, and they listen to those inner voices, and they listen to whatever says, you know what, I don't think it's this. I'm going to look over here, or I'm going to do this test, or, hmm, you know, like they allow themselves to let go of the constraints of traditional medicine, medical teachings, and think out of the box and, and confer with other people. You know, they admit to themselves that I don't know this and that's okay. And I need to go deeper. Um, just giving a pill or just having a surgery is not enough. I really want to get down to the root causes of what's going on with this person to heal them permanently. That is what I strive for when I work with people, that is what I wish medicine was about, that we listened to people, trusted their intuition, encouraged their intuition, and, um, and were able to be open to different kinds of practices. Um, you know, acupuncture, Ayurveda, herbal medicine, whatever, I mean, Chinese Traditional Chinese medicine is amazing. Like these things have been around longer than traditional medicine and they're amazing. And I think that there's a place for, for all of it. You know, when I found out that I had Lyme disease and co-infections and things, um, it was my naturopath who found it and a lot of other things. And I had had test after test after test and probably had it since I was a kid, but I didn't get it diagnosed until my forties. But we were able to literally cure it and take it away using all natural treatments. And I, I did a lot of spiritual work and, and nutritional stuff too, but um, you know, traditional medicine was not of help to me. And, and it took different approaches. Um, every Lyme case is different. A lot of illnesses are like that. So for, you know, what worked for me may not have worked for, for someone else or just, you know, my individualized concoction of, of things. Like I'm not a big believer in, um, in one size fits all protocols. I don't, I'm not a fan or of self-treatment, not a fan of that either because herbs are not innocuous. They have side effects. They interact with other herbs or vitamins or whatever. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um, but I would like it to be that practitioners are, you know, work with their patients. They work with maybe holistic providers. They're open to things besides just prescribing or, you know, and that they don't blame their patients for things like, oh, you know, th those symptoms, your knees wouldn't hurt if you lost weight or whatever. Like maybe it has nothing to do with weight. So, you know, just kind of, I think, I think patients are, are blamed for a lot of things when doctors don't want to admit that they don't really know what's going on. So, Well, I think that there are, are great reputable people and there's people who aren't. Um, I have a huge issue with people who are not licensed and not qualified to issue diagnoses because that's illegal and unethical and or telling someone that they've been sexually abused. Um, 
especially someone who's not a licensed counselor. Um, I really have a problem with that. And when I work with people, I will identify symptoms. You know, I'll say symptoms such as, you know, that may be familiar, me may be part of Lyme disease or might be part of, um, you know, sinus issues or whatever the thing is. So I will say that, and then people can verify those symptoms. And then in terms of actual diagnoses, that's when I refer out to licensed practitioners or recommend that they get certain tests that you can do. Um, there's a lot of hormone testings and things that you can do at home. Um, so I really refer them out to licensed practitioners. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of, I, I love energy healing. I think Barbara Brennan, um, anyone who doesn't know about Barbara Brennan, her, her books are pretty amazing. And Reiki and all those kind of things. I think that's all really, really incredible and amazing. And I think, but the danger is that you, um, you think that that person is healing you. And so I don't ever want anyone to be dependent on me or substitute my intuition for theirs. I work with them, but you don't need someone to like take negative energy away from you. Um, you don't need someone to bypass your own healing mechanisms and heal you. You work in conjunction with that healer. Your body works in conjunction with that energy. So I think, I think if the person is encouraging empowering you, um, encouraging you to get in touch with your own body and healing and that you work as a team. Um, I think that's one of the most effective things. Um, and just, yeah, people who are issuing diagnosis or, or claiming that they can, you know, fix you. I, I, I think that can be risky in a way to get let down and spend a lot of money. Well, not only bad stuff, like I think, um, I, you know, talk with people a lot about this and some of what has come out of that has been pretty, pretty positive. Like people being alone with themselves for long periods of time and having to process their feelings, having to do more self care, having to do more self soothing, um, figuring out maybe that the job that they were in or going into that office or whatever was really toxic and they really need to do something else. Um, maybe uh, a, a great one is people weren't around their dysfunctional families as much. You know, you didn't have to go over to, to grandma's house and, and experience all that negativity. Um, it gave you, you know, if you didn't have the strength to be like, I don't want to go, you had an excuse. Um, so it made you think about how you feel away from those people and, and maybe that you don't want to go back to that situation. Um, so I think that it has, that, that while it did bring on, you know, a lot of kind of depression and anxiety things and, um, and isolation, and I think it was extremely hard for a lot of people, what can come out of that pain and those crises can be some pretty huge changes. So it's a very, you know, certainly a very interesting time. Um, I think, I hope that it has made people think about taking responsibility for their own health in terms of exercise and listening to their body when it comes to eating and movement and um, because there's viruses everywhere. But if we have a strong immune system and we have a strong constitution and we take care of ourselves, we're much less likely to get them. So um, I think, you know, time will tell. I mean, it's, it's a very fascinating time for sure. I do actually, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, cause I would like to be doing more of that and I've been doing quite a bit frequently. Um, yes, working with animals is super fun and I tune into people's pets or whatever animals they have. Um, I tune into their energy. I receive information from them. 
about their emotional health, their physical health, um, their life, you know, maybe their life before they got to their owner. A lot of people have rescue pets, which is wonderful, but then the pets have these weird behavioral issues or destructive behavioral things and they don't know how to stop it and they don't know where it came from. Um, so I get information about maybe how they were treated before, maybe about their anxiety, um, you know, issues going on in their body. I had, um, I work with somebody who their pet kept licking their, the top of their paws and it was getting raw and it was just really, really bad. And it was so, so painful. The person couldn't even touch it. And, um, I saw their joints actually, not even the skin. And I saw that the joints were being worn away and that there was cartilage issues and, um, and issues in the hips and that it was really about the pain of walking and that animals soothe themselves through licking. So the animal is trying to soothe that pain by licking it and they weren't getting any relief. So um, as it turned out, they brought their you know animal to that and, and that was confirmed. So once they were able to help with some of that inflammation, the animal stopped licking its skin until it was bleeding. Um, but the cool thing about doing animal readings is also that animals are here to take care of us. So they pick up on a lot of our traits and a lot of our issues and the animals tell me a lot about their owner and issues that the owner is going through and how to help them because that's really what they're concerned with is how can I make my owner's life better. So the pet readings kind of are like kind of, kind of a two for one thing. You get information about your pet and you get information about you. And during that process, I make intuitive soul paintings for those animals. And it's the same thing that, you know, energy stuff comes up, physical stuff comes up and, um, and all kinds of messages. I just did one for somebody and there something about the dog's mom, um, came up on the painting and the owner confirmed that that's exactly what, you know, what the circumstances were. So, um, yeah, animals are, are pretty amazing. I definitely think that we humans get reincarnated as animals and, you know, and vice versa, because they're just such highly spiritual, intelligent beings. Yeah, so my website is katiebeecher.com, K-A-T-I-E-B-E-E-C-H-E-R.com. Um, I'm on Instagram at Katie Beecher Medical Intuitive. I'm on Facebook, Katie Beecher Medical Intuitive. And I even have a group, a private group on Facebook for people who are reading the book and want more information or guidance or, you know, want to ask questions. Everybody, to everyone who's participated and watched. And thank you to Susan for her great questions.